lottery myself, I guess. No, it's, it's not the world. I'll lottery for the next 30 hours. <laughs> uh, well, I'm uh, happy to, uh, as the local host of the meeting, also happy to, to welcome everyone here to Tucson. It looks like we got a little bit of sort of monsoon rain today. Um, but I'm going to talk about a, a case of uh, potential homoploid and allopolyploid uh, hybrid speciation here in, uh, in Selaginel, in the Sonoran Desert. But first, I want to just mention uh, uh, some time with Jim Hickey, uh, who I did my master's with back in 2001 to 2003. This is uh, from the Bahamas trip. Jim wanted to be taller than me, and so forced me to crouch down. Uh, <laughs> yeah, anyway, and, uh, and here's another one of these famous Jim with the snake pictures that Mike Vincent was showing earlier. I think this is a, a brown racer out yeah. there on the western edge of Andros Island, you know, where it kind of dwindles into the, the, the Sargasso Sea out there. And here we are with, with Jim, the time we forced, uh, our lab did, forced him to go to Botany 2003 in Mobile. Uh, and we took the, the Fern Field Trip picture that time and he had to be right in front. It was pretty funny. So, um, and one of the, the great things I, I, I enjoyed during my time working on um, uh, revisionary work, uh, uh, revisionary taxonomy in Jim's lab, was diving into these species complexes, right? I think a lot of us that, that get into studying uh, ferns and lycopites in particular, uh, really dig all the hybridization and polyploid that happens in these, these groups. And this is the uh, North American uh, Dryopteris uh, hybrid complex. And one of the things you notice about these reticular grams when you look at them, is there are a lot of you know, uh, diploid species here that produce uh, fertile polyploids of some sort. But there's a lot of sterile diploid hybrids or you just don't really see the diploid hybrids anywhere. And this is a, a pretty common thing out there in nature that we have. Um, you know, maybe estimated about 15 or 20 percent or so of, of extant species in plants are, are allopolyploids. Um, and there are very few known diploid hybrids, uh, despite that abundance of allopolyploids out there, the fertile diploid hybrid species. Um, and so one of the things that we, you know, there's a whole host of questions that we, that we want to ask about um, the biology of, of polyploid and hybridization. But one of the things that, that we often want to know is what, is what are those relative contributions of polyploid and hybridization uh, to plant evolution? And what are the challenges? Uh, in teasing apart those different forces is that many of our allopolyploids are actually hybrids also. So you get into these sort of what is what is responsible here? What is for some of these phenotypic changes or the ecological changes that we see? Is it hybridization or is it polyploidy or what? And so one of the things that we'd really like to have, you know, to help sort some of this out uh, as, as plant evolutionary biologists are examples maybe of where we have both diploid hybrid speciation and allopolyploid speciation from that same parental cross where we get those same combinations uh, to try to see how that evolutionary experiment's played out in real time and, and in nature. And these are kind of few and far between, actually pretty rare. Um, there are a couple of potential examples in the literature. Uh, the, the most compelling is the, our, our comes from Les Gottlieb's work in Stephanomeria, uh, the diploid uh, hybrid Diogensis and, and, and its tetraploid Elata, which appear to have uh, perhaps the same uh, uh, patterns when you look at isozymes and NITS data. Uh, and another potential example in, in peony, it's a little bit less compelling uh, of a case that those two are from the same uh, parental cross. Um, but they're, they're out there nonetheless as potential examples. And what I want to talk about today is a potential example here in the desert, what I call the, these unicorns of plant evolution, uh, where we might have a homoploid hybrid and the allopolyploid from that same cross. And this is uh, work that has been done by one of my PhD students who's now uh, recently graduated. Uh, is at Yale as a Donnelly postdoctoral fellow working, uh, he's currently collecting viburnum, I think, uh, for Michael Donahue and Erica Edwards. And he totally does not approve of me putting his picture with these unicorns. <laughs> uh, and I totally tweeted that out to a few thousand people. So, um, so Selaginella are, are heterosperous lycophytes, they're about 800 species, and they're renowned uh, for many of the species are resurrection species, including these. Uh, they have really small nuclear genomes, uh, and that allows us to do some interesting work with it. And the two species in question uh, that we've been studying out here in the desert are Selaginella arizonica, and it forms these big mats across the desert. It's, it's out here all over the slopes. Uh, and it actually, in, in ecological surveys of the Sonoran Desert, uh, uh, anywhere from 30 to 40% of most of these, these surveyed sites are actually, the ground cover is actually Selaginella of some sort. Uh, like for example, at Tumabot Hill, 40% uh, of the ground cover there is actually Selaginella arizonica. So it's uh, uh, not a rare plant out here. You can almost do transects uh, for, for these species in particular, drive, get out of the car, go walk over and grab some. Uh, and not do anything because they resurrect. So for doing genomics, it's really quite nice. Um, this is uh, another diploid species, Selaginella aromophila. This occurs 
uh, up in uh, Southern California and then to Baja. This is from uh, Anzo Borrego, a wonderful site called Hellhole Canyon. Um, <laughs> it's not that bad, uh, but anyway, um, these are the these two species, and I don't think it's going to play our little resurrection. Well, you can see it on my lab's website, um, uh, a video of these resurrecting in about three or four hours when Hurricane Newton came through back in September of 2016. Uh, as I said, these two uh, diploid species of Selaginella occur in, in pretty distinct habitats. They, they, uh, uh, Selaginella arizonica is uh, over here in the Sonoran Desert and occurs throughout Arizona. Uh, Aramophila is found in uh, uh, much lower elevation uh, sites uh, over in uh, California and in Mojave. Uh, and they have these uh, hybrid zones here. They have some contact zones, I should say, um, in Oregon Pipe National Monument and outside Phoenix and places in rural uh, Maricopa County. Uh, there are strikingly different uh, uh, looking for Selaginella, and I know that the Angersperm folks in the room are gonna <laughs> roll their eyes. Um, but it's, they're actually pretty easy to identify. Uh, Ara, uh, to, to tell these two species apart at least. Uh, Aramophila has, is much smaller and more compact as you'll see. And they have these contorted uh, 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 penny on the top of the uh, on the tips of the of the uh, microfills, whereas Selaginella arizonica and these are very deciduous. Um, whereas Arizonica has these really solid, strong, like they'll poke you, uh, indurate uh, uh, tips on those microfills. And as I said before, these two species have a sort of a hybrid zone uh, that we think we've been studying uh, out here at Oregon Pipe National Monument uh, and in Phoenix, and it does continue into in the proximal areas of Mexico. We don't have a lot of collections uh, from those sites, or, or in our collections at least. And when you start looking at herbarium specimens of these plants, when you go out to uh, plants that have been collected in, uh, in places like uh, Oregon Pipe, like this specimen here, you'll see that it was first recognized, identified as Selaginella arizonica, right? And then here, it's been relabeled as Aramophila, and then you can't see it because this is covering it up. And it says, wait, uh, this is mixed. And then there's another thing that says, wait, these are hybrids. Um, <laughs> so there are whole pools of these, for those of you that have spent your time, time in a herbarium, where there's just piles of these, these intermediate specimens where uh, Mike Windham and George Yatskevich have gone back and forth, I think, on labeling some of these. So when you look at the morphology, uh, you can see here that Aramophila is a much more compact species than its uh, diploid relative Arizonica. And Anthony went through and collected a, a number of traits, about 18 traits from, from about 100 sheets, uh, from both Aramophila and these two species that we believe are hybrids growing here in the hybrid zones. Uh, from Phoenix and Oregon Pipe, which are distinct from each other as well. When you uh, uh, analyze the PCA of their traits, uh, Anthony finds that these are intermediate between the two parents, as you might expect um, for uh, uh, hybrid taxa. And when you do the chromosome counts, you see that it looks like the plants around Phoenix are always about double the two parents. So the two diploids that we have in this case are 2n equals 20, and Aramophila is 2n equals 18. And 2n equals maybe 38 and 18 in the case of the organ pipe plants. This is a range, not because we think the actual number ranges. These are these nuclear genomes are about 60 to 80 megabases. The chromosomes are about three megabases long. They are the hardest things in the world to count. Um, so the length of a Selaginella chromosome is about the same length as a human haplotype block, right? Um, tiny, tiny, tiny little things. Um, so we, we, we know that they're morphologically intermediate, we know they're out where they are in the landscape, uh, and we know that there are a couple of floidal levels at play here. What we really want to know is, are they actually hybrids of these species? And if so, is there evidence of hybrid speciation happening in this, in this case? Uh, and to explore that, we've uh, sequenced uh, and analyzed annotated genome and transcriptome sequences, uh, and we have looked at testing their hybridization status and the relationships using uh, model testing in, in the Phylonet framework. Uh, as well as using uh, the D statistic, in particular the D1 statistic from Hibbins and Hahn, uh, to test for evidence of hybrid speciation. I'll show you some results from that work here now. So just think about the, this in a very general framework, but hybrid is descended from two sampled parents and you sample a whole bunch of gene trees. You'll get some gene trees that follow a pattern like this, where you have one parent, Arizonica, uh, that is sister with the hybrid tax or whatever it might be, sister to it, maybe 40% of the time, 40% of the gene trees. And here, Selaginella bolosii is an outgroup that we use in this case. And maybe some other fraction of the time you'll see that the hybrid taxa uh, goes with uh, the other parent. And you always end up with some fraction where Wallacei well, is in there and you get some, some, some different uh, set of trees. Um, and with Phylonet, we can also uh, not only test those kinds of models, but test the support for uh, phylogenetic networks. And, you might, and what you end up producing are, are figures that look like this, 
where we ask, are these actually the parents too, when you combine all those, those information? Um, and you get different kinds of inheritance probabilities um, because of all sorts of integration and back crossing as well as the <coughs> fractionation and diploidization that might be happening uh, depending on the, the ploidal level of these, these hybrids. So what do we see when we look at this in Selaginella, these Selaginella hybrids, or putative hybrids? Um, so this putative homoplate hybrid organ pipe and this allochiploid phoenix, so looking at organ pipe, analyzing about 300 single copy gene trees um, pulled out of the, the annotated genomes and the transcriptomes uh, from these populations. We find that about 48% uh, and 52% of the genome comes from Arizona versus Arimophila, and that we do find the best supported model uh, is this phylogenetic network uh, with the highest uh, log likelihood score. For Phoenix, we have a similar number of, of gene trees. We find a, a, a similar ratio, about 40% of the gene tree, uh, of, of, of the genomes coming from Arizona, 57% from Arimophila. Um, and again, both of these are the, the, the we've tested uh, over uh, 14 different uh, combinations of, of uh, phylogenetic tree models. And these are the best supported models in the situation where these are hybrid products of uh, uh, Arizona and Aramophila uh, with, with the, the highest log likelihood scores and really high delta AICs for adding other, so once we add any particular edges, we get much better model support, for example, for these, these particular sets of relationships. Um, uh, so that's pretty good evidence that uh, these are in fact uh, hybrid products of those two parent frontal species, um, or at least we're really close relatives of those parents in our sample data set, how's that? Um, but we believe these are probably the parents based on some other data too that we don't have time to talk about. But, so we do see that this, there's pretty good support for this, but that doesn't tell us is it hybrid speciation. Right? That's a very different thing. Um, and so with this sort of data, with phylogenomic sorts of data sets like this, there are some new ways of testing um, uh, for support, at least, or if the pattern that we see in the data are consistent with hybrid speciation. Uh, and one of those is this new D1 test statistic and D2. We're just gonna talk about D1 from uh, uh, Mark Hibbins and Matt Hahn. This was published in genetics, I believe, back in May. Uh, it's been on BioArchive for a little while. Um, and the way this works is that you can imagine that instead of having hybrid speciation, we could have hybridization uh, and speciation don't happen at the same time, right? So it could be that in this case, we have here, for example, Arizonica, and maybe this organ pipe plant diverged more recently uh, than Aramophila. So our time, our coalescence time doesn't go back as far. And then subsequently, this taxa hybridized with Aramophila, giving you a signal of, of hybridization in the data. Alternatively, you could have hybridization and speciation happening at the same time, right? The, the situation that we would expect with hybrid speciation. And the D1 statistic allows us to test for this uh, by looking at the difference in divergence uh, in the, in the, the, the coalescent times from Arizona to minus Aramophila, in this case, uh, subtracted from Aramophila minus organ pipe. And if you have that D1 doesn't equal zero, then it tells you if it's significantly different from zero that hybridization and speciation are not, uh, we're not coincident. How's that or not? We're, we're far enough apart in time you can tell them apart. Uh, and if you have hybridization and speciation, D1 is indistinguishable. It's, zero, it's, it's approximately zero. Those two processes are, are, are indistinguishable and it's consistent with uh, a hybrid speciation uh, event. And that's what we saw here. So uh, we saw that uh, D1 was, a, was 0.0295. That's a, a, a non-significant p-value. That D1 uh, is indistinguishable from zero. This is, this is exactly what we'd expect um, with this statistic if this is a, a case of homoploid hybrid speciation. Um, and so overall across the, uh, these uh, data sets, this sort of phylogenomic analysis of hybrid speciation, we do see that these two taxa uh, at Oregon Pipe and Phoenix are likely the, the hybrid progeny of, of Arizona, Sledgenal Arizona and Herbophila. Um, and they're different ploidal levels, suggesting this might be a really nice worked out case, hopefully, of uh, homoploid hybrid and polyploid speciation from the same time. And in the case of organ pipe, uh, where we can do this multi-species coalescent test, the D1 test, um, we see that hybridization and speciation occur at the same time or indistinguishable from those two, based on that, that statistic. Um, and Anthony is doing tons of other data here, whole genomes analyses and population genomics that I don't have time to talk about, and ecological, uh, ecophysiological analyses, and they all resurrect in different ways, and there's all sorts of fun stuff. Um, that he's got a, a, a stack of papers uh, to write in between all his Viburnum papers he's going to be writing, no doubt. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank everyone for coming out today and take any questions.